As always throughout this video, there are going to be infographics because I want to make sure that the day that this video is being posted versus when it goes up, and especially because this is a long video, this is a longer form video, and there's going to be a lot of information being said, I want to make sure that throughout this video, the infographics are 100% accurate to what is happening currently going on, both in Gaza, Palestine, with the genocide that is being uh, committed by the Israeli occupying force colonist settler state but also what is happening in the united states because across the united states uh, at this time it is a student revolution students on college campuses across the united states are currently having peaceful protests they're uh doing encampments peaceful protest encampments uh in support of palestine and gaza and also opposing their universities for how they choose to spend money and also just like act about the genocide that's happening in Palestine and Gaza that the United States is funding. And these universities are taking extreme violent actions by calling in police force, but also the fucking National Guard. And a lot of people, if not all of the people on our government are supporting that. And saying, yeah, get the get the National Guard, enjoy your free speech. So college students that are peacefully protesting are being um, attacked. So please remember that in the United States that the police and the military are not here for our protection and they're not here for our rights and freedoms. They're here to protect uh, and solidify the complete dominance that our government has over us. This is not a democracy, this is a fascist police state. So before anybody points it out, one, this hat will probably not stay on through this entire part of the video. Uh, two, I am sick, so I sound disgusting, and also my energy is absolutely fucking ground zero. Three, this is an extremely long video. You will be reminded periodically throughout this video uh, about all of the things that are happening pal in Palestine with the genocide and what's happening in the United States with the student protests. So... I don't know if you want to grab a notebook and some notes, but today, this is a very exciting video. I'm so pissed that I'm sick because I'm, I've am been so excited about this video since I came up with the idea. And I specifically wanted to post it now because, like I said uh, a video or two ago, that may, at least what I've seen with, like, people doing artwork and stuff, you know, like, art challenges on social media, May is Mermay mermaids that was your hint also this shelf right here is all of my like mermaid and fairy books so this is very exciting today i want to talk about the lore and the world building of both uh h2o and mako mermaids and h2o story both store both tv shows and stories from my childhood they came out in the both before 2010 i'm like 90 percent sure and Yes, it's a children's show, but yes, I am looking maybe too much into it because both of them are like my comfort shows. I've seen every episode of every season multiple times. I'm obsessed with them. And the world building makes absolutely zero sense when you combine them. And we didn't combine them. We, the fans, me, we didn't combine them. They combined themselves. So we're going to talk about it because I'm very, 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 very... <laughs> into it and I think about this literally at least once a day so <laughs> okay the hat lasted through the intro and it probably will not be on anymore and the hair will probably be tied up I cannot do it today I'm gonna lose my mind so we're gonna start with H2O because it was the first show out of the two that came out and it also has the groundwork for a lot of the world building. Also, let me just note that any pictures you will see here will be uh, specifically from Pinterest, and some of them may have been slightly edited just to be in collages by me, but all of the pictures are ori like originally from Pinterest. They're probably not original to Pinterest, but I'm just telling you where I got them from. 
So for anybody who might not know, don't worry, this is not the Return to Oz video. We're not doing an entire synopsis of the show in every season. However, overview. For those of you who don't know, H2O is a story about three teenage girls, Cleo, Ricky, and Emma. They are besties. They're not actually besties at the beginning of the show, which is wild, but they're best friends who all become mermaids. And then it's like the trials and tribulations of being teen girls while also being mermaids. So like, yes, there's like preservation for the ocean and like fish rescues, but there's also like boyfriends and dealing with relationships and dealing with school. So very cute, very fun. Again, one of my favorite shows of all time. The way the girls become mermaids is through a series of silly little events. They uh, are in a boat that gets kind of brushed by the waves and everything by the ocean to this, this island. Uh, it's, I want to say off the shore. I'm not good with distances. I don't know how far Mako Island is supposed to be from like where they live, uh, whatever town they're living in in Australia. And I think specifically it's Australia. I don't think it's New Zealand that they're on. So Mako Island is a bit out of the way of where they live. But uh, through a series of events, they're on a little boat that gets brought to Mako Island by the waves, by the ocean. You know what I mean? They're a little bit stranded. And on Mako Island, they decide that they're going to go to the peak to see if they can get better cell service because they can't call anybody to rescue them. And they end up falling kind of into a cave and everything. And they find this. It's the moon pool. It's called the moon pool. It is a pool inside of a dormant volcano so it's the pool and then you can see straight up into the sky through like the tube of the dormant volcano and on a full moon they're in the water because they're going to swim out through the water to the cave exit and on the full moon they are gifted mermaid powers they obviously don't know it that moment of but when they wake up the next day anytime they touch water they turn into mermaids so that is the lore in logistics of the moon pool, which is where I want to start out because the moon pool is prevalent and it's important and it matters across both shows. I'm so sorry that you can see me aggressively fixing my dress every five seconds. I just don't understand why one side is like aggressive bra strap and the other side isn't. Why don't I just, whatever, why don't I just do that? So the moon pool is the most important thing here. Apologize to Cleo, Ricky, and Emma. I love all three of them. They're not the most important part of this, unfortunately. The moon pool is the most important. The moon pool is where they have all of their mermaid meetings, right? If they're being mermaids, they're at the moon pool. It's private, it's quiet, it's where they got turned into mermaids, and it's the safest place they can be. The only other person who knows about it for the first two seasons, or like a season and a half, is uh, Lewis. We love Lewis. We love to see him. Okay. However, Cleo, Ricky, and Emma are not the only people who know about the moon pool in the history of the show. Because throughout all of season one, there is a strange old woman. Yes, she is white. <laughs> I feel like that's not surprising. There's a strange old woman uh, called Miss Chatham who kind of follows Cleo around and like whispers cryptic shit to her that like very much is like, I know you're a mermaid without straight up saying, I know you're a mermaid, right? She also ends up getting herself involved with Emma. I don't remember exactly something about her like being old, an old lady that like another kid of this show is harassing. It's a whole thing. Emma is our little goody two shoes and we love her to death. Miss Chatham ends up revealing season one. It's still season one. Miss Chatham ends up revealing that at one point she was also a mermaid. It is very unclear to me if she is still a mermaid or not because she has a lot of discussion about how me and my friends, they were an, a different set of three girls. It was Julia Chatham, Gracie. No, it was Julia... Louise Chatham, that was her name, and Gracie. Miss Chatham never says necessarily. She talks a lot about how the th her and her friends had so much fun. You know, she sees herself in Cleo, Ricky, and Emma. They were all mermaids together, but, you know, they've drifted apart. Different things have happened. 
and it's never clear whether Miss Chatham is still a mermaid or not. But it is clear, and she does point, like, say specifically, that they became mermaids, her and her friends, the same way Cleo, Ricky, and Emma became mermaids, which was stumbling upon Mako Island, being in the moon pool on a full moon, and being gifted mermaid powers. And they became mermaids. I checked the H2O wiki. This is this important to me, right? I checked the H2O wiki. They became mermaids in 1955. So this moon pool and this dormant volcano on Mako Island specifically has been around since before the 1950s. We don't know exactly how long, but it's been around since before the 1950s because we don't know how early people were like traveling to Mako Island to check it out because Mako Island is, from what I understand, it multiple times throughout the show, they talk about how it should be a wildlife preserve, but I don't know if anything actually becomes of that because of the events that happen. So we know at least that 1955 we had mermaids and the, I believe the show takes place in like 2007 or something like that. So we have mermaids and two different areas. These are the only mermaids in H2O, in the H2O show. Three in 1950, three in 2007. The only mermaids. In season two of H2O, uh, it is revealed that Gracie, one of the three girls from 1955, has a granddaughter. Her name is Charlotte. Pause, back it up. When Cleo, Ricky, and Emma become mermaids, they discover that not only are they mermaids with mermaid tails, but they also have powers. All of them can manipulate water, but it's in different ways. So Emma is able to freeze water. She turns water to ice, okay? Uh, Ricky is heat, boil, warm up, whatever. She's able to do heat water, that kind of thing. And Cleo is able to manipulate water in a way that just, like, she fully controls it. She fully just, like, makes it move. She can cause problems if she was powerful enough, I'm sure. Do I think if Cleo was, like, god-level anger that she could cause a tsunami? I do believe that. Cleo is my favorite fucking character. <laughs> Justice for Cleo always. I know Cleo probably was the one that made it out the best, and probably has the best outcome throughout the both shows. Justice for Cleo regardless. So in season two, as I said, uh, Charlotte is introduced. And Charlotte, we find out throughout the show, is Gracie's granddaughter. Charlotte discovers the mermaid situation. She discovers the secrets that the girls and Lewis have discovered. And she goes to the moon pool on a full moon and becomes a mermaid. So again, the only way you can become a mermaid in this world building, in this lore, is by being in the moon pool on Mako Island during a full moon in the water. And it's very, very, very obvious and basically like thrown in your face that there's only supposed to be three mermaids. The show makes it like the show makes it in a way that if you wrote it down in a book, somebody like reviewing your book would be like, that's too obvious. We can't make it that blatant. You know what I mean? They make it very obvious that there's only supposed to be three mermaids. There were only three original mermaids, as we'll call them, the mermaids that were turned into mermaids in 1955, which were Julia, Louise, and Gracie. Keep your notes. If you're taking notes, make sure you have your notes, right? <laughs> We're covering a lot of things. We're going back and forth. I was doing a good job at being linear, but I'm not anymore. The show is making it aggressively obvious that there were three mermaids originally. There are three mermaids now. There is not supposed to be a fourth. It is completely unbalanced because Charlotte ends up having all three of their powers in like an uncomfortably OP way. Like, she's able to freeze water, she's able to heat water, she's able to manipulate and control water, but it's so much more so than the other girls. And it's very just, everything about Charlotte makes me uncomfortable. Like, I need to rewatch the show and maybe, like, look at her in a slightly different lens, but I refuse to. I could get into, like, character analysis in a different video, but this is about the lore and the world building. 
I have to stay on this track because if I don't, I will go on a tangent and this will be like a six hour video and not maybe an hour video. I don't know. But it makes it very obvious that Charlotte is not supposed to be a mermaid. Very, very obvious. So what ends up happening is the girls, Cleo, Ricky, and Emma, and Lewis, uh, end up sort of, they end up tricking Charlotte because they find out at the end of season one that you can temporarily give up your mermaid powers, which I don't even know why this is a thing. I do know why it's a thing in the plot of the show and the like the two or three episodes that it happens in. It still is like, this is where I feel like there's like a first plot hole. You know what I mean? Like whatever story and world building and lore they were going for, I feel like this is where the first plot hole is. You can temporarily give up your mermaid powers during a lunar eclipse or solar eclipse. Which one is it? It's just an eclipse. I don't think they actually specify in the show. What's up with that? I don't remember. Do they specify in the show? If they do, I'll correct myself here, but I don't think they do. But during an eclipse, you can temporarily temporarily give up your mermaid powers. So they do that at the end of season one. And it, in season two, uh, they get Charlotte to give up her mermaid powers because she like fall, they like, they don't push her, but she falls in the moon pool during another full moon. And that's how Charlotte loses her mermaid powers, but the three of them don't. So this is a very specific, like, power dynamic magic situation going on in the H2O world. Because you can only get your powers from the full moon in the moon pool, specifically. But you can also lose your powers in the moon pool on a full moon. So the full moon, which I am an astrology, spiritual, girly all over the place. I don't necessarily understand all of it, but I am. I also believe that the full moon has like more power over humans than other people may think. However, the way they're doing this in H2O is again, this is where I feel like there's plot holes here. Because what they're saying in H2O with the end of season one where they temporarily give up their mermaid powers and just the fact of becoming and unbecoming a mermaid is solely dependent on the moon pool and the full moon. That is the lore. That is the magic system that they have worked here. The supernatural system is moon pool, full moon. And you go all of season one and two thinking and knowing as far as we know this is the only like logic that we have here there is only one moon pool and it is on mako island in australia off the coast of australia again i don't think it's new zealand i think it's specifically the coast of australia so as far as we know that is the only moon pool in the world it's the only one that exists i would also like to point out that the full moon has incredible power over the mermaids that they are in no way shape or form able to control throughout the first two seasons are the ones I remember the most actually no it was all in season one from what I can remember because do they deal with a full moon in season two I don't know and then the full moon in season three is a whole thing but in season one each girl Cleo Ricky and Emma all have to deal with the full moon being like aggressively powerful all three of them experience the full moon essentially taking over. They come into like an almost hypnotic state. And it's from the minute the full moon is in the sky to the minute it sets. Like it's gone. And that doesn't happen until like 9 a.m. in some episodes, like depending on when it is. So Emma, who is like very, you know, very stereotypical, like early 2000s, like character profiles. Emma is very like studious, the good girl, like a million extracurriculars. She wears blue. Like that's that's the whole thing. Emma turns like very flirty, very silly, very like oh, what's his name? Byron. There's this boy that she has a crush on, but she's so shy about it and his name is Byron and then like she she's a mermaid. Like she has her tail just like out flopping. Uh she's hiding it, but she's like laying on the floor in a hallway and she's like Byron I'm over here Byron and he comes over and they're like making out on the floor it's like it's right it's weird when she comes back the next day 
to herself. She has no memory whatsoever of what happened and like is absolutely shocked and appalled at the way she acted. When it's Cleo's turn at the full moon, uh, Cleo essentially turns into a siren. She can't sing any other time. She's fucking tone deaf, couldn't carry a tune if it came with handles. She essentially turns into a siren where she doesn't actually like sing sing. And I don't mean anybody who sings like this. I'm not saying not singing, but in the show, it's not like she's singing like words with like spells. She's just like, what is it? It's I'm not going to be able to do it because I'm sick, but it's like, like that kind of singing she's doing that kind of singing essentially becomes a siren it's a whole goofy episode about how like all of the teenage boys in town are like flocking to her whole thing when she wakes up the next day again absolutely no memory of what happened and the voice that everybody heard the day before is completely gone because she like calls a radio station and she's like you're gonna want to hear this and then when it plays on the radio station once the full moon is set it's her usual singing voice, which is awful. <laughs> it's so bad. Ricky goes into like all... Ricky's is interesting because I still have not been able to figure out if it's specifically for the plot of her and Zane getting together or if it's supposed to be more that then they just like didn't do anything with it and then did other things with Ricky that they probably should have tied in to her full moon episode but then just like never did. It's very confusing but Ricky basically goes like full unresolved trauma and like everything she's doing like anything she touches she's turning bright red like her color is red of course. She's turning bright red, like everything she touches immediately like overheats. Like I think she blows up like a drinks container without meaning to. Uh, and then she basically runs away and like hides at Mako Island because she has a whole thing about like nobody understands, nobody's ever going to understand, like all I do is hurt people. And when she's walking around Mako Island like trying to like hide and like be somewhere that makes her comfortable as she's walking and her hands are kind of like trailing over things they're lighting on fire so like different plants like shrubbery anything they're lighting on fire uh and when zane goes to talk to her she kisses him again she doesn't like th and this is where i'm confused as well because ricky seems a little more knowledgeable of what, what's happening to her than cleo and emma ever were she kisses Zane and he passes out because she like boils his blood, essentially. That's what I'm getting from what the, that interaction. When they find her, it's like the morning and she still hasn't snapped out of it, which, which is again why I believe that like there's something going on with Ricky. And we do look more into it in season three, but it's different in a way, right? Ricky has, again, the same thing. When the girls find her, she's like, I'm meant to be alone. All I am is destructive. When she snaps out of it, you know, they, they've they had their whole friendship. Like, we're in this together. We're always mermaids together. That's a whole thing. So the moon has this power over the girls. It has the power over the girls by being the reason they're mermaids. And it can be the reason they're not mermaids. And it also has the power of basically putting them in like some kind of hypnotic state where they have no knowledge whatsoever of what's happening to them. They act completely out of character and they can be incredibly destructive and dangerous. But as soon as the full moon sets and is gone until the next one, everything's perfectly normal and fine. Right? So that is what H2O is setting up here. Charlotte loses her mermaid powers because she is in the moon pool during a full moon. She is a mermaid. It turns her not into a mermaid. This also happened with her grandmother, Gracie. It was voluntary. Gracie chose to not be a mermaid anymore. And the necklaces that, like, they end up wearing in H2O, it's the same lockets that Julia Gracie and Louise Chatham wore in the 1950s and 60s. It's their little, like, friendship mermaid lockets. Gracie threw her, threw her into the, 
threw hers into the moon pool. The lockets are like super plot driven through all of season one. And then once all three of the, the R girls in 2007, Cleo, Ricky, and Emma have their lockets, they don't matter anymore, which fucks me up so bad because they were so important in season one. Drives me crazy, okay? Jewelry is important to note though because it becomes a reoccurring theme throughout the other seasons. So that's all of season one and two, where we're learning about there have been mermaids since the 50s, but there's always only three. We get a fourth one. She's too overpowered. She has to leave. We get to season three of H2O, and Emma is no longer on the show. It is because the actress, Claire, Claire Holt, that's her name, uh, was doing other things. That's fine. However... We're not talking about the real life implications on a fictional children's show about mermaids. We're talking about the storyline and the lore in the fictional children's show about mermaids. So Emma is gone. So Cleo and Ricky have lost their third mermaid. However, they meet a girl named Bella in season three. And we find out that Bella is also a mermaid. Technically, this would be a fourth mermaid again. Technically, it would. Technically, it would be. Because Emma is still alive. She's just on vacation. She's on vacation in South America, apparently, which is, I don't know about that. And from what we know, Emma is still a mermaid. There was no discussion about her giving up her mermaid powers. There's no acknowledgement whatsoever other than Emma is just not here with us. So technically, Bella is a fourth mermaid. Charlotte was a first, fourth mermaid. She threw off the balance. We had to get rid of her. But now Bella's here. Bella has her own mermaid powers. It is not a combination of the three. It is not a combo of anything. Bella has her own mermaid powers where she is able to make like jelly sort of out of water. I want to say it's going to be similar to like Studio Ghibli almost. Like however gelatinous the water is in Studio Ghibli, right? Except not really. It's odd. I don't know how to describe Bella's power. And I also don't know how that's supposed to be, like, helpful. I love Bella. I have nothing against Bella. But, like, what the hell? So, okay. An additional mermaid with new powers. Not similar, not, you know, overpowered, anything. New powers, new mermaid. Bella was not turned into a mermaid on Mako Island in the moon pool. When Bella was a little girl, she I she's somewhere between seven and nine. I can remember, never remember exactly which one she says. When Bella was a little girl in Ireland, and I could get into like the real world lore and legends and everything on another day. We can look at the further implications another day. Today we're specifically talking about these two shows. In Ireland... When she was a little, little girl, Bella found her own moon pool and was in the moon pool on a full moon and was turned into a mermaid. So again, the full moon in the world of H2O, the world building the lore of H2O, has the power to turn people into mermaids when you are in a moon pool. However, there is not only a moon pool in a dormant volcano in Australia, there is a moon pool somewhere in Ireland. So it opens up the idea, they never go any further into this, by the way, they never discuss it again as soon as you get Bella's backstory. They never look into it, they never do any further research, they never do anything like that. This is telling you, in the H2O Mako Mermaids world, that there is more than one moon pool after they spent two seasons telling you this is the only moon pool. They never say that outright, but like, come on. Why are we only focusing on the Australian mermaids, right? There is at least one other moon pool in the world. We have had mermaids at the bare minimum in this universe since the 1950s. So the one in Australia has existed for some time. We have to assume at least since 1900 because it was established and it was there in 1955 when the first mermaids became mermaids in H2O, the first mermaids that we have knowledge of. There is another one in Ireland, apparently. And from what we know and understand, Bella is the only mermaid 
from that moon pool in Ireland. And I don't think it matters what moon pool you become a mermaid in. I just think it matters that there's a fucking moon pool <laughs> with moon magic that turns you into a mermaid if you are in that moon pool. You know, I think that's what matters. I don't think it like Irish mermaids and Australian mermaids. I don't think there's a difference, but that's there you go. So that's what they pose it as is Bella is not an unbalancing act. Bella is now part of the trio because Emma left did not lose her mermaid powers though. We have to operate on the system that we know that Emma still has her mermaid powers and is still a mermaid because it was very specifically stated that Gracie from 1955 gave up her powers. We don't know what happened to Julia and we have no idea if Louise still has her mermaid powers because Miss Chatham always only says it used to be the three of us. We were so happy together. And then, you know, things happened and Gracie gave up her powers and we all drifted apart. You know, things were never the same after this situation happened. But she never actually says whether she's a mermaid or not. And it's never a situation where she could be like revealed as a mermaid. Because even when she's on her boat in one episode, she's not like getting wet. And they get her off the boat before it starts sinking. So we don't know. Are we going to operate on the system that we think that the mermaids from 1955 are no longer mermaids? Because we don't know what happened to Julia. All we, Julia dies. Like, we just know that, like, Julia died at some point because Ricky finds her locket in, like, a jewelry store. So it's it would be, like, up to us, I guess, in this video where we're trying to piece together information to decide whether or not we're going to go off the system where the mermaids from 1955 no longer have mermaid powers do we assume that they don't especially because it seems like there can only ever be three mermaids at one time but then again emma from what we can put together and assume emma is still a mermaid she's just in south america like that this is where things are like unraveling for me yes i am looking too deep into this i don't care i'm obsessed with it and i love having this conversation so with Bella now involved, there are more characters, there's more plot line, there's more happening. The first full moon of season three, I don't remember 100% what happens to the girls, but I do know that there's, I believe it's like a mini meteor shower or like shooting stars or something, but something happens to the moon pool. From what I can understand, it's either a supernatural, like, primordial being, or it's a moon alien. Either way, I'm fine with it. But what it boils down to is there is a creature in the waters of the moon pool. The girls get attacked by it several times throughout the show. Ricky gets attacked, gets brought all the way to Mako Island like she gets like sucked up and brought all the way to Mako Island and Ricky ends up having some kind of communication some psychic link to it in some way shape or form because she and this being create like an understanding and Ricky feels comfortable with it and feel safe with it. But when Cleo and Emma, or not Cleo and Emma, I'm so sorry, Bella, I'm doing you so dirty. Cleo and Bella are not able to like get into the moon pool. They're, they're attacked by the creature, which is a whole other thing because once all of this is said and done, again, we never discuss it again. We never talk about why Ricky specifically seems to have a little more consciousness when she's affected by the full moon and why she was able to, out of everybody, have this connection with this sea creature, with this moon alien, with this magical being. It feels, again, I could get into characters specifically, but it feels very much like there was so much planned for Ricky writing wise and they just never did it but kept like the major storyline and just said I don't know <sighs> but Ricky is able to have a connection with it the other mermaids are not which again begs the question as to why mermaids in general are not safe from this creature 
it's one specific mermaid, which can be an entire video on itself, but it's one specific mermaid and not mermaids as a whole. Which for the next part of this video, we need to keep that tidbit in because mermaids as a whole become a lot more together than they seem to be in H2O in the second part of this video. So for now, put that off to the side, write it down in your notes. There will be a quiz at the end. Ricky ends up having a connection with it. And I don't remember exactly how because I haven't watched the show in a long time. Unfortunately, I don't have a Netflix subscription. Nobody can afford that shit. There becomes a realization. There becomes a realization that there is going to be like a cataclysmic event, essentially, starting on that part of the globe, on the part of the world that is Australia, specifically starting there. So yeah, there's another moon pool in Ireland and maybe, assumedly, other parts of the world. But the one in Australia on Mako Island in a dormant volcano is the one with the most influence, has produced the most mermaids, and is of the utmost importance. Because there is a cataclysmic event coming and it is specifically happening starting on this side of the world. And yes, it will spread to the other parts of the globe, but it's starting here. And they are at the center of it. Specifically, Mako Island is the center of it. <laughs> I love thinking too much into things because they're so silly and fun. The girls discover this. Oh, and also they've discovered that in the walls of the moon pool, there's like, I don't remember if it's like specifically going to be considered like a geode or whatever, but Bella has a necklace that she got from a rock in the moon pool in Ireland where it's like a beautiful stone that like glows. And this is why I said jewelry holds a lot of importance in the H2O universe, except for the lockets, because after season one, the lockets don't fucking matter anymore. But Bella has a necklace of like a beautiful blue stone that is from her moon pool in Ireland. And they discover in season three that the moon pool in Australia on Mako Island is like has the stone within it. And the stones have some kind of magic like imbued in them. The stones are magical. The moon pool is magical. It's just like what is the consensus. So the girls all end up with a necklace of it, right? And it's a gem almost. It's like it's a rock. It's a gem. It's a stone. It ends up being treated more like a gem, even though they like specify they're like, it's a rock from Mako Island. It ends up being like a gem. All of the necklaces are like very rough cut. They're not like refined. They're not shaped like how my necklace is. My necklace is also a moon necklace. It is the shape of the moon on my birthday when I was born, the year I was born, and it glows in the dark. Anyway, it's very like rough cut. It's not like, you know what I mean? It's not designed. It's not like a pendant or anything. It's just like a piece of stone that gets like fastened onto a necklace. All three of the girls end up wearing one. And what comes down to it is there's going to be a cataclysmic event. Like, I, I don't know if it's supposed to be like asteroids, meteors, specifically what. But it's like the moon. Like, I don't remember if it's the moon specifically. Like, something's wrong with the moon and like shooting shit out of its orbit. I don't remember. But they are the three mermaids, Cleo, Ricky, and Bella. I almost said Emma. Cleo, Ricky, and Bella are the only hope that we have to surviving. Also, the moon pool is damaged beforehand. So the moon pool, I've put pictures up throughout the video. I know I have. However, the moon pool has a very distinct look to it. We're going to look at it a little bit better now. Do you see how it's very specifically shaped? We've seen the entrance, to like, you know, from above to see the full moon and everything, like where it perfectly goes over and grants its magical powers. There's a very specific shape to it. However, there is damage done to the moon pool, pretty much in the episode where the mermaids have to fucking save the world. There's damage done to the moon pool where there is no longer an outside exit. Uh, it gets like, you know, it caves in on itself. So you can't access it from actual Mako Island. You have to only specifically come in from the water. So only mermaids would be able to access it, right? Or, you know, divers with the stuff they need. Or if they're really good at holding their breath, like the random boy that they threw in in season three. Again, I could get into characters on another day. There's no longer an outside exit. You can only access it specifically through the water passageway. 
And what is sort of like, there's room to walk, there's room, you know, around the moon pool, and there's, it's very, I mean, you've seen the picture, it's very clearly like kind of laid out nicely, there's that additional rock where they like, kind of prop themselves up on. It goes from that to like completely destroyed. You still have access to the water, you're still able to access the water, but it seems almost like the outside ring of sand and land is just gone completely. The island's way of preserving the moon pool and keeping it protected could be. Uh, and it's specifically damaged to get their hands, the characters that do it, to get their hands on more of the rock, gem, stone, moon, crystal that are in the walls of Mako Island. Walls of the moon pool. I don't know, does more does Mako Island have more stuff on it? Yes, it does, but that's part two. Whew, getting ahead of myself. So with the moon pool damaged, the mermaids get to the moon pool and it's supposed to be like, because it's damaged, they're worried that like it's not going to do what it needs to do. The creature is damaged. The creature is like not there anymore. Ricky's freaking the fuck out. Uh, essentially what happens is with their powers, which is one, manipulating water just in general, two, heating water in any capacity, and three, uh, like, jellifying it, making it gelatinous. I don't know. Again, I don't really understand Bella's power, to be quite honest with you. It feels like they needed to make something up for Bella. Poor darling. I feel like we could have done a lot of other things with water and we just chose jelly. But between those three powers and the help of the creature, sea creature, primordial being, moon alien, uh, basically what happens is like a terrifying meteor is like about to hit the fucking world and the three mermaids use their power and the necklaces that they're wearing of like the moonstone from the moon pool are glowing and they're using their powers with the help of this creature to like stop the meteor. It's very much like they're like fighting for their lives, looking upward. They're falling into the water, like starting to sink a little bit. Um, there are characters on like the beach of Mako Island that are like, holy fuck, we're gonna die. Like that meteor is like hitting Earth. And they manage to save the world. Nobody off of Mako Island is seeing this is what we're told to believe because it's only showing the characters on Mako Island land and in the moon pool. We're not seeing the reaction from everybody else on the mainland. So it's very central to Mako Island. Again, may not be the only moon pool, but it's the only moon pool of importance. We are centralized on Mako Island and they save the day. They save the day. Everything's fine. None of them are dead, which is weird. They don't even seem that winded about it when they <laughs> when they end it. And I say it's weird that none of them are dead. But the effort and the drama we go through in season three for that to be the outcome is just like kind of wild. Like I know it's a kid's show, but like you do so much with your lore and your world building and then you make choices that are just like, um, okay. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there. They save the day, essentially. They're the mermaids. They have their new necklaces. And that's it. That's the show. That is all of H2O. All of its world building. All of its lore. That's what we're left with. We're left with Lewis coming back from being in America. We're left with, like, the couples and the non-couples. We're left with a new character knowing that there was a moon pool with like I don't know if she thinks it's magic or not again I don't remember like that you know that kind of detail because I haven't seen it in a long time but there there's not I don't know I don't remember if she like knows that they're mermaids by the end of the season I just I that's where it ends and Bella is singing her um she's singing the theme song but that's it that's all we get so we come away with a couple we come away with a couple notes that I've already screamed and yelled about throughout this part of the video, but we're going to keep our notes here at the end. We're going to double check them and we're going to review this because this is important for part two of the video. One, there can only ever be three mermaids on screen at any given time. A fourth mermaid, whether we know if they exist or don't exist, cannot be there. 
There cannot be four mermaids around at one time. Three is the number. I don't think that has any significance to the overall anything other than like the very blatant like what's happened in H2O. The moon is the power. They, the mermaids, have no control over those powers. It is given to them, taken away, and controls them, whether they ask for it or not. You can learn tricks, like temporary, temporarily suspending, losing your powers during an eclipse. You can voluntarily step into the moon pool to either gain or lose mermaid powers, but you cannot control anything other than like knowing you're stepping into the moon pool on a full moon. You also are overtaken by the full moon and its power during a full moon. You have no control over your actions or your consciousness. Moon is the ultimate power. <laughs> moon is the god here. We worship the Mako Island moon pool. We also know that regardless of what we may or may not know is there seems to be at least one other moon pool. We know of at least two. Whether or not there are more, never discussed again. Never. Not even in, eight, um, in Mako Mermaids. Not even in Mako Mermaids, it's like discussed. Because while they discuss other things, which again we will get into in the next part of the video, uh, they don't really discuss more than one moon pool. So the one in Ireland, I guess we're just fucking off and forgetting about at the end of the day. Because the moon pool on Mako Island seems to be the be-all, end-all moon pool. Cataclysmic events centered around it. <laughs> It has produced the most mermaids. So the one in our the moon pool in Ireland just doesn't fucking matter. Or it matters the most. And we will never get more information about it. So those are the notes I want you to keep on hand for part two of this video. Because in part two of this video, we are going to be discussing Mako Mermaids. And do you think it says Mako Mermaids in H2O story? Do you think, like, hey, Heather, maybe they're not connected? especially with everything you're about to start talking about. Maybe they're not connected, and maybe they shouldn't have been connected, but I didn't connect those dots. The writers and the people that made these shows did, and it's not my fault. There might be a part three of this video to really collect all the information, but for right now, what I understand, there's only two parts. While I'm currently filming this, by the end of the video, there's probably three. So enjoy part two. Thank you for joining me for part one. I'm having an absolute blast, even though I feel like garbage. And just remember, the, the United States is funding a genocide. It's not a war, it's a genocide. Because what Israel is doing to Palestine and to Gaza and the people of Palestine and Gaza is genocide. They are starving people, they are breeding grounds for disease, they are cutting off water, electricity. They're not doing it actively, I'm saying cutting off, but they, they've already done it. They are creating mass gra graves. They're bulldozing people. Live people. They're running over people with tanks and bulldozers. They have absolutely decimated every medical center that was left in Palestine and Gaza. And they are doing whatever they can to kill absolutely everybody. As it, it is an ethnic cleansing. It is a genocide. You will not forget that while we're having a fun time talking about mermaids. The atrocities that Israel is committing, that the United States is actively funding and funneling money into, is a genocide. And it is an ethnic, ethnic cleansing. You will not escape it in this long-form video about mermaids. Because the Palestinian people cannot escape it.
I think you can tell by the fact that I've done my eyebrows for the first time and like I couldn't even tell you how long the last time I did makeup was uh, that I'm feeling a little bit better but I am so so tired genuinely if I laid down in my bed right now I could fall asleep but let's get into part two because I know the further we go into part two the more heated and like I'm gonna get so let's get into part two but before we get into part two here's your friendly reminder that while we are absolutely 100 standing with the students that are protesting across the country at their universities in stance for palestine for gaza against the genocide against their universities that are most almost definitely all either in support or like funneling their tuition money uh into donations towards the genocide we are also keeping our eyes on Palestine, on Rafah specifically, because the day that this goes up, I'm not sure if it's going to have happened already uh, or if it's something that's like coming up while we're all distracted by the protest. They're not distractions. We should absolutely be protesting. I say we. Everybody should still actively be protesting and supporting the protest and raising those voices. However, uh, the Israeli military occupation that is being funded by the united states by our tax dollars if you live in the united states are planning on doing i'm not sure if it's like a carpet bombing specifically or just like doing a swipe through rafa to just make sure they're doing their ethnic cleansing that they keep wanting to do so desperately and continuing to do uh and rafa is almost completely populated by children at this point orphaned children so Make sure you're still checking out Operation Olive Branch, and I cannot remember the exact um, organization donation fund off the top of my head, but Operation Olive Branch, and there's another one, I will put it here. Donate to them. The links will be in the description. Do whatever you can. Any families that we can get out of Palestine and Gaza that are seeking to get out, if we can all donate a dollar to like at least one of the funds, we can get maybe one family out. And it is very overwhelming and it is very hard, especially when our tax dollars are being taken away from us to fund the genocide. But if we can do at least one family at a time, that's better than fucking nothing. And it's better than what our politicians are doing. So you will get infographics and periodic reminders throughout part two as well, just like you did in part one, to remind you to help Palestine and not shut up about what's happening in Palestine and to the people of Palestine. It is a genocide. It is not a war. All right, hello frenzies. This is part two of the H2O and Mako Mermaids and H2O story lore and like background and world building and storytelling analysis. We're doing part two. Last part, you sat through all of H2O and all of my discussions. Do we remember the notes that we took at the end of part one? Good. This is part two. And this part is where I'm gonna have to try very hard not to get sidetracked, not to get like... I'm gonna try not to put too much of my personal opinions in on this part. We're just looking at the lore and world building and background. I'm not putting... I'm gonna try so hard to either not put my own opinions in at all or wait until the end of the video and just get through part two, the explanation and the analysis. And I also have to try very hard not to get sidetracked when I talk about specific characters. I could do a separate video about strictly characters throughout this show and these these two shows, the series, whatever. I could do separate videos on that. This is not the time or place because this video is already going to be staggeringly long. So let's get into it! <laughs> All of the knowledge we have gained from H2O, all of the rules for the world building, all of the rules of like the magic and the like why things happen and everything. Take those notes, put them off to the side. Because we are about to throw all of it out the window. Don't throw it out the window, keep it on hand, but we're about to throw all of it out the window. 
I will say before we start this video that Mako Mermaids is not and was not advertised as like a sequel to H2O. It was advertised and was ca just called an H2O story. So it doesn't necessarily mean it takes place in the same universe, but it is still mermaids. So in the world of Mako Mermaids, there's a couple things you need to get down knowledge-wise, first and foremost. First of all, I can already feel myself wanting to like be like, but it doesn't make sense! <laughs> I have to hold off, I have to hold off. First of all, we still have Mako Island, and Mako Island is still in the same place geographically. That's the word I'm looking for. It is still in the same place geographically that Mako Island from H2O was in. There is a coast of Australia, a, a area in Australia, and Mako Island is off the coast of that. It is in the same location. We are not on a different part of the island of Australia. We're not. That's a big thing that they, I mean, maybe they don't implement that in the show, but I was always under the belief that we are essentially in the same part of the island. And Mako Island is in the exact same spot. It has not moved. We are not talking about a different Mako Island. It is the same Mako Island. <laughs> this is gonna be a long video. <laughs> you can tell I already want to like start arguing so bad. Mako Island is in the same place. The moon pool is the same moon pool. And it shares the appearance of the moon pool from the end of season three of H2O. I'm not saying the two of them are connected. I'm not. But it is the exact same appearance as that moon pool. However, the difference between H2O and Mako Mermaids is that Mako Mermaids introduces us to this world version of reality, whatever we want to call it. It introduces us to this world where there are established mermaid pods. There is not random happenstance like what happened in H2O where it's like, you know, specific magic from the moon that gifts mermaid powers. At random, there are established mermaid pods. There is a history, a mermaid history, to the point where the mermaid pods have councils. And there is a Mako pod, specifically. There are there are slight differences because uh, there is one mermaid in the show that is from the northern pod, but I believe the Mako pod is one obviously giant pod, but then there's the southern Mako mermaids and the northern Mako mermaids. You feel me? So the Mako pod has been a pod for an undetermined amount of history. They really don't give any background within the show, and I was double checking a couple things earlier today on the Mako Mermaids wiki because I thought one thing but I think I got like wires crossed with maybe H2O so I just wanted to double check that before I you know came on here and started saying stuff because I want my facts straight <laughs> even though the show itself doesn't really do that but there's no like established time period we just we start the show we start Mako Mermaids with the knowledge that there are established Mako pods, there are established mermaid pods in general, the Mako pod has a mermaid council, and clearly mermaids have been around long enough to have a council, to have established territory, so on and so forth. There are other mermaid pods as well. We don't really learn that more. We do know that, but you don't really get more information about other pods until season four of Mako Mermaids. But that that is that is the history, that is the world building that we're working with in Mako Mermaids. Established pods, we have a mermaid council, there's a history of mermaids. Understood? Okay, good. Start taking notes about Mako Mermaids, page two of your notebook, put the other notes off to the side. We're not looking at them right now. This will be on the quiz at the end of the video. <laughs> oh, and, and it's established, their mermaids and their pods are established enough that they have different patrols around Mako Island, just so that we're keeping the area safe. I'm um, the way I think of it and the way it's kind of like presented to us in the show is they're like maybe not necessarily protecting the entire island of Mako from humans, but they are 
obviously protecting the secrets. So if like people come to Mako, you know, they're going to do things to like deter them. They're going to maybe like do what they can to make like the waves a little choppy. So like people are like, oh, okay, maybe I don't want to go over here. Maybe they might have like specific sea animals like come close to boats. So people are like, never mind, let's leave Mako alone. Again, it is not a wildlife preserve in Mako Mermaids either. And I think it's also mentioned a couple times in Mako Mermaids that like maybe Mako Island should be like a wildlife preserve so like not too many people come over. It's talked about so many times and then nobody ever does anything about it. I vote that we make Mako Island a, a like a, like an a, like a sanctuary, like a nature sanctuary, a, a nature preserve, whatever I just said. I literally forgot the word as soon as it came out of my mouth the first time. So with that knowledge, with the knowledge of the established pods and everything, and the knowledge of that there is a Mako Island patrol, you know, that keeps the island safe, you would also like to know that all of the mermaids, you remember how I said that jewelry was very heavily present and we got two different types of, uh, you know, sets of jewelry in H2O? We had the lockets that like bonded the three girls in friendship of being secret mermaids together. Then we also had the moon necklaces with the moon stone on them. In Mako Mermaids, we have moon rings. They wear them usually on their on their pointer fingers, which is weird to me. I don't know, like even like to be like moon power, like it's still, I feel like it should still be in your ring finger, regardless. They wear them on their pointer fingers and it is the moon ring. So they are able to access a greater level of magic, obviously, than what the mermaids already have. The mermaids have power. All of the mermaids do. All of the mermaids in the Mako pods have basic power, which is the same powers that Cleo, Ricky, Emma, and Bella had. They can do all of those things. They can heat water, they can freeze water, they can, can manipulate water, and they can jellify water. Still haven't gotten over Bella's powers. Those are basic powers for the mermaids. However, the moon ring amplifies it. So all of the mermaids have one. Uh, when you are a young mermaid in the pod, you have to go through whatever, you know, test um, evaluation that the Mermaid Council has, you know, stated so that you earn your moon ring to amplify your powers. The mermaids in Mako Mermaids are also not affected by the full moon the way that they are in H2O. So it is very, it's a very different situation where these are random happenstance, random magic, supernatural involvement to established community, established world building, established magic. The mermaids have their powers, they know about their powers, they are not affected by the full moon, and they have a chance to earn moon rings to amplify power. And the entire plot of Mako Mermaids is that one day, a random boy and his friend decide that they want to go camping overnight on Mako Island. And Zach, his name is Zach. I was going to say one of the boys, the main character, Zach. Uh, it is a full moon when they're on Mako Island. And he is drawn by the full moon into a strange part of the island. And he's able to access a chamber that is pre-existing. When he enters the chamber, something happens. He falls into the moon pool from above. Uh, and in the full moon, in the moon pool, we're getting callbacks to H2O, he turns into a merman. If you've noticed through the beginning of this, Mako Mermaid section, and all of H2O, there are no mermen. Zack becomes a merman. Zack is not supposed to become a merman. This exact instance is the only similarity to H2O, where it's random happenstance, random moon magic that cannot be controlled by other mermaids or by the specific person. So the entire plot of Mako Mermaids, all four seasons, even though season three was like six episodes long, it was very weird. I still don't really understand it. I don't know what happened there. You know what I mean? I get a little confused. But the entire plot of the series is that Zack is a merman and he is not supposed to be a merman. Zack is influenced by the full moon, just like the mermaids in H2O. This is where the callbacks are. 
he is influenced by the full moon where he is put under a type of hypnosis if he sees the moon's reflection and he is always drawn to Mako Island. The girls weren't. In H2O, the girls weren't necessarily drawn to Mako Island. They always end up there because obviously that is the safest place for them to be so that people don't find out they're fucking mermaids. But Zack is always drawn to, to Mako Island. He is always going back in his like hypnotic state. He is always looking for something. You remember the chamber I mentioned? Again, as I said at the beginning of this part of the video, there is established history in the Mako Mermaid series. Mermaids have existed long enough in and around Mako Island to have established pods, to have established councils. They have history, they have uh, magic, because there is a mermaid that is introduced in season two and then continues on to the end of the series. Her name is Mimi, and she is specifically from the northern Mako pod. And it's mentioned quite a few times that she's specifically from the northern pod because there is a rumor or like stories or like hints rumors that northern pod mermaids are more dangerous so again an established history the chamber a pre-existing chamber that zach stumbled into before he became a merman was able to access and then was dropped into the moon pool from by magic he's in there and he's at a wall and he's like touching it trying to do something he doesn't really understand but he's doing it and the floor beneath him like liquefies and he falls straight through there is no roof to the moon pool it is once again inside of the dormant volcano right he's dropped into the moon pool from inside of this chamber this is a pre-existing chamber there is history on mako island and around mako island because as you go through the series, you discover that one, mermen have all of these have always existed alongside of mermaids. Now it seems that they are extinct, or there are very few of them. This is what I went to check on the wiki. I thought, and I I still think I'm right. I have not been able to see the series in a while because, again, I do not have a Netflix account. I am not paying that much money to watch mermaid shows. I'm sorry. As much as I want to, I'm not doing it. I believe, and I don't think I'm wrong when I say this, that there is mentioned in the show in one of the seasons that there are only like five or six mermen left in the world. I'm pretty sure that is like an established thing that is said, but I could not find anything about it on the wiki when I was double checking earlier. So from what we understand and are like taught throughout the show is that there are very few if any existing mermen left they are essentially extinct because again mako mermaids has a clearly established history at one point there was a war so the mermaids and the mermen of mako island have existed long enough for there to be a history of war there was a war between the mermaids and the mermen because the mermen, for whatever reason, I don't think it's ever like explained, explained. They get into like why things are happening now, but they don't ever explain like what happened then. The mermen, for whatever reason, wanted to destroy mermaids. Probably because they were outnumbered. Like, let's look at it from a real life perspective. And I know that's asking a lot, but let's look at it from a real life perspective. A group of men wanting to destroy all of the women come on come on <laughs> come on <laughs> yeah there was a war we have enough history to know that there was a war between mermaids and mermen the mermen wanted to destroy the mermaids for whatever reason there is and the mermaids uh it was oh there was something specific that happened that i cannot remember off the top of my head if i can remember it i will add it into the video but there was something specific that happened and I know that the mermaids were like basically about to be defeated but something happened and they ended up winning uh and the mermen were killed off or died off or were chased off and they were weak enough to die off on their own that's the kind of situation we're working with and then the mermaids all of like the evidence of mermen that were left on Mako Island because obviously at one point they lived on Mako Island or lived around Mako Island simultaneously with the mermaids so they are 
just like the mermaids have their mermaid council, they have their moon rings, they have like specific parts of their appearance, like specific traditions. The mermen also had their fair share of that. The mermaids after the war made sure to hide, wipe out, destroy whatever they could of the mermen. Because obviously when there is a war that causes incredible detriment to a people, the oppressing side of it, you want to get rid of it. When you have your safety, when you have your area, you would like to erase the oppressor's part of it. Topical. How funny is that how topical that is? So the chamber that Zack finds is a merman chamber, specifically. And I believe it's one that the mermaids may not have known about. Because it is a rock chamber, it's like a doorway that he has to get through that's like within the rocks. It's like a cave. And he goes further down into it and then there is like a, it's like an ocean mirror almost. Like it's it's kind of a mirror but it's like a doorway of like waves and magic. And when you enter that, you, it's like, it's like a capsule reality almost. It's a capsule reality, big, you know, ocean room where the exit is kind of like way off in the distance. Like how they do it, like how it is in dreams. Uh, and there is a trident there. And the trident is a very powerful weapon, unfortunately. So either the mermaids didn't know about this, and this was like, kind of like the secret tool that the mermen were going to use at one point, or the mermaids did know about the trident and they specifically fucking sealed that shit because it can only be accessed by mermen. Throughout season one, where there is the power struggle of getting the trident to possibly destroy it and make sure that it cannot be used to harm the mermaids, the mermaids are only ever able to access it when Zack already has access to it. It can only be accessed by mermen. So again, either the mermaids didn't know about it at all, or they knew about it, did whatever they needed to do, maybe with like a merman prisoner or something, and like to make sure it was sealed, and then they made sure that there, there were no more, no more mermen. Then, throughout series, uh, throughout the seasons two and three, you find out that, like, under the water and on the island, but, like, around the coast, that there are multiple, uh, like, rocks and cliff sides with carvings etched into them of specific, I don't, I don't know if rune is the right word, but it's carvings of specific runes, specific symbols. Those are all throughout the island. In season two and three, there is a separate merman chamber. The first one was like the trident chamber, I think is like the correct term for it, because that is specifically where the trident is held. They do end up destroying the trident. I think Zack specifically is the one that has to do it, or he gets help from, like with the additional mermaid powers, you know what I mean? I don't remember exactly, uh, but Zack is able to destroy the trident. It does get destroyed, I think it like in pieces on the ocean floor. So like if even if you find a couple pieces, you're not gonna find all of them. Something like that, I believe. But season two and three, along with the additional runes that are all over the island, whether they're in the water or right out like right on, you know, the edge of the coast, which again, established history. These have been here long enough to have been made by somebody in the past and they're just being discovered now. That is, that's the thing I want you to get in your head about Mako Mermaids. There is established history. Things have happened before this show started. But there is another uh, merman chamber and I, it's, I forgot exactly what it is, but it's like an open room and there's water. And I believe there's multiple little pillars, but there's one specific pillar that Zack has access to, and he can control it because he is a merman. Oh, I don't remember. And there, I know there's like a, it's a circular room with like water going around the edges, but there's like a platform in the middle and either there's the smaller pillars have the symbol or the platform on the floor has the symbols. I don't remember exactly like those details, but one of the two in that room, there are the symbols that correspond with the symbols found around the island. Zack has the platform. It's almost like a little computer platform, but it's like obviously stone. Uh, and it's, he's able to control it. Also what happens uh, in season two and three is you meet Eric. This is where I would like to remind you that I am not going to get into characters as best I can. 
because if I could make a video specifically just about the H2O and Mako Mermaid's characters, I would make probably a series specifically so I could have an entire episode talking about Eric. Spoiler alert, I would not be nice about Eric. But you meet Eric uh, in season season two specifically, but uh, season three. Two, season two and three, you meet Eric. And Eric is another merman. And he's moving, he's moved up to the Gold Coast. The Gold Coast, yeah, of Australia. That's literally what it, it's referred to as the Gold Coast a couple times. He has moved from the South. And I don't remember exactly why he's moved because I don't think it has anything to do with like feeling the merman, like tingles, the energies, the vibes. But he moves up, uh, he finds out very quickly that Zack is a merman. And then he's like, weirdly obsessed with Zack. Because Eric is extremely interested in finding out any and all merman secrets. Which begs the question, where has Eric gotten his information enough to know that there is merman history? And that's a question that's left unanswered in the show that I really wish they had, like, touched on more. Uh, because Zax is all trial and error. And Zax is that hypnotic, not being able to control himself state that he falls under, under a full moon, that draws him to the island each time. He's not finding these things at random. He is being led to them by whatever the magic of the moon that exists in this universe it's never random. It's never like he's just like under his hypnosis and we stumbled upon it. It's always he, his body is going. He is headed there. How he knows or whatever this magic is doing to lead him here, lead him there, he knows where he's going in a sense. And then what they find afterwards, like he always like kind of wakes up from the full moon trance, like again, when the full moon sets in whatever the area is, and he always has to be like, what the hell? But then when he every time he tries to go back, it's either specifically under a full moon where he's not aware or when he's being heavily influenced. Besides the point, Eric is a new character that shows up and has enough knowledge somehow to know that there is merman history somewhere on Mako Island and he accesses it. Whether he doesn't know it's specifically on Mako Island and he has to learn that or he do he has suspicions about Mako Island is something that I'd have to go back and watch the show to confirm. However, he is the one that like heavily pushes for it, especially the way that season one ends and season two begins. Uh, Eric is the one that heavily pushes the involvement on Mako Island throughout the rest of the two seasons. So that's a whole thing. Eric is the one that recruits uh, this kid named Cam, who is part of season one. I also could make an entire character video about Cam. Spoiler alert again, it would not be a nice video, just like Eric's video. I probably should put them together if I ever do those videos because I have thoughts and opinions and they are not good ones. Eric recruits Cam. They are the ones that find the symbols throughout the island and they are the ones who try to like put together like a, basically a pamphlet for Zach to be like, hey man, look at this information we found. You have access to the terminal. Let's get into it. Eric is unable to lock the mermaid chim uh that that merman chamber, the circular room with the symbols on the floor and the little pillar that's like almost a computer panel. But he is not able, he's able to control it, but he's not able to control it well. And again, this is another detail that like may have been said in the show, but I just don't super remembered off the top of my head I believe Eric is a like born merman like it is in his DNA I don't think Eric is a merman that was like random happenstance like fell into a moon pool became a merman like I think it is like his DNA but for whatever reason he is not able to control the merman chambers well and he does he is able to access them but most of the time he like needs Zach's help when he's in them and he does very much take advantage of the fact that, like, Zack is, like, under the full moon spells. And Eric is not ever under, like, the full moon effect. It's only ever Zack, which is incredibly interesting. On top of Eric, we are introduced to another new mermaid 
This mermaid is made, though. She is not part of the pod. She is not an established mermaid before the series starts. In series two, one of the times that Zack, I think, I believe it's the first or second, like, full moon spell that Zack goes under, uh, he has a girlfriend that is established. Her name is Evie, who has reasons to distrust and not love the mermaids that we are introduced to from the Mako pod. Uh, however, the ones that come from the Mako pod in season two are much more aggressive. And we have that mermaid Mimi that I mentioned earlier, who is from the northern pod. She's much scarier. She has a lot of knowledge of spells and energies and powers that she uses more so than anybody else. What I It's the first or second time that Zack has introduced or, or not introduced is under the influence of the moon spell. And he, you know, heads to Mako Island as he do. And Mimi and Andina, who is the other mermaid that's introduced in season two, have a plan that they are going to, re uh, what is it? What is the word I'm looking for? Not reduce. I'm looking for a specific word. They're going to undo how Zack became a merman. Because don't forget, in season one, Zack became a merman because he fell into the moon pool on a full moon and turned into a merman. Very similar to what we know of H2O. They have a plan to, like, fix that, to undo it. Reverse! That's the fucking word. I keep wanting to do, like, redo, return, re but reverse. Reverse is the word I'm looking for. They have a plan to reverse it. So Mimi, with her knowledge of spells and magic, uh, comes up with a potion that is the... What is happening here? There's like a weird right here, like a very strange glare going on. I don't know what that is. I'm so sorry if that's like really obnoxious in the corner over here. I can see it too. They have a plan to reverse that. They Mimi makes a potion specifically that is the power of 50 full moons. And as mermaids from an established pod who have access to moon rings, they both have a moon ring, know how strong that is. That is the potion they plan on using. Uh, Zach is in the moon pool. They're planning on using it. He's not like in a trance when he's in the moon pool, which is like the weird part. I don't remember exactly why that happens. But he's not in his like hip under like, you know, the full moon influence. Uh, and right as the spell is, like, working, like, taking over him, like, he's surrounded kind of by the magic, his girlfriend is there. She shows up because she has a distrust for the mermaids, which if you watch the series, you understand where she's coming from. And she kind of pops up in the moon pool because she is an experienced diver. Her and her father dive all of the time. She's, she's an experienced diver. She's a great swimmer. And with that power that... Mimi and Andina are trying to hit Zack with, Evie gets hit. And Evie is turned into a mermaid. Not specifically from being in the moon pool on a full moon. She is in the moon pool on a full moon, but she is also hit with the potent power of 50 full moons in a spell potion form. So that's another way that we have mermaids. Born into it, Moon pool magic, potion magic. So now we have another mermaid. We have a newly made mermaid. All of these things are established. Apparently all of these things can be true at once. Between Evie learning how to be a mermaid, the other mermaids still trying very hard to take away Zack's mermaid power, merman powers, because he's not supposed to exist. He's not supposed to be a made mermaid. Merman, whatever, you know what I'm saying. He's not supposed to be a maid mermaid. Evie's not supposed to be a maid mermaid. And the other merman, mermaids would like to get rid of all the additional ones and just live their pod life because the existence of mermen threaten the pod. Whether or not Zack specifically is threatening the pod or just the existence of mermen, period. It threatens the pod. If you remember their history and their fucking war that they had with mermen. Hello? And what you discover, uh, it's the end of season three, which is wild to me. In season three, Zach is starting to see certain things occasionally that, like, he's not seeing. And so is Mimi. A couple times they know that Zach and Eric are in the mermaid ch merman chamber because Mimi is seeing things, but not with her eyes, not with her own eyes. She's not anywhere near them, but she's seeing that they're in the mermaid chamber because you discover that Zack was not a maid mermaid. 
Zach is born merman. It is in his DNA, just like Eric. Mimi's mother from the Northern Pod is missing. She is one of the most powerful mermaids in I'm assuming all of the pods that they're aware of, but in the Mako pod, especially in the Northern faction, she is one of the strongest mermaids. She is also missing. We also have no idea where Mimi's mother is. That is why she's with the Southern pod, because she needs to be taken care of. She has a friend in, Aunt, in Andina. That's just how it is. Mimi's mother is Zach's mother. And when, I believe they're twins. I think that, I think they are in fact twins. When Nerissa, that's her name, had her twins, uh, she knew that because of the established history that mermaids and mermen have, and the fact that mermen tried to fucking kill all of them, she knew that her child would be in danger. So she left Zach on the beach to be adopted by the parents that we get to know through the first three seasons. And we love, we love the Blakeleys. I love the Blakeleys. They are so lovely. Zach's mom and dad are everything to me. I love them. They're the cutest. They like, they love him so much, but they are his adoptive parents. And there is a conversation about that in the show. He does uh, learn that, you know, they adopted him. They chose him. They found him on the beach and they were like, you're our baby now, because that is exactly what Nerissa had planned. So you discover that Zach and Mimi are twins and Zach was always meant to be a merman. Whatever spell, whatever magic that Nerissa used to hide his merman form and keep him safe was broken by being in the moon pool, being directly under the full moon, being in that line of like incredible magical energy that exists in this world of mermaids. He was always a merman. He was always meant to have a tail. Him finding the mermen chambers were just, it's just a meant to be situation. You know what I mean? Like he was never human. I kicked the camera. He was never human. It was never supposed to, like this was always like an established series of events, essentially. Everything that happens in season two and three, I believe there's a, there's like a stone. There's like a power stone or something. Uh, that Eric cannot control because again even though I believe Eric is like born merman as well for whatever reason he has no power over it and I do wonder if a lot of that has to do with like the like genetic magical abilities that exist within the mermaids this is also just never discussed Mimi is incredibly powerful she's incredibly powerful like sorceress sea witch whatever we want to call her Zack is also an incredibly powerful merman who is, is able to access these chambers and control the magical artifacts that the mermen have left behind. Eric is able to control them to a certain extent. It can never go to a higher point for him, essentially. Zack is able to go to that higher point. So some things happen. I don't, rem again, I don't remember like these super fine details, but basically Zack saves the day, almost dies. Mimi has to save him because it's that like shared extreme magical power and at the end of the day we seal up the mermaid merman chambers we you know we kind of leave that stuff off because that part of the story is over and done with and eric leaves season four is where everything unravels for me <laughs> but it does still some of it still makes sense in world so the whole point of season four specifically and this is, this is where I want to say that I feel like I don't know the history of, like, the actual TV show. I don't know about the history of, like, production, like, actors and actresses possibly leaving, just like uh, Claire Holt did in H2O. I don't know anything about that. But I get the sense that seasons three and four of Mako Mermaids are very similar to what happened to The Legend of Korra, where every season of The Legend of Korra, they weren't sure if their show was getting renewed. So the seasons of Legend of Korra feel very disjointed from each other and feel like completely new plots every single time without a lot of like connection to the previous season because they were never sure if they were getting a, a renewed season. So then whatever, I think it was Nickelodeon specifically, the Nickelodeon would be like, yeah, okay, I guess I'll give you one more. So they would have to kind of put something together because they never knew for sure. Seasons three and four of Mako Mermaids feel that way to me because see, the way seasons three and four go just feel very, 
disjointed and like, ah, fuck, what can we come up with next? Still love the show, still obsessed with it. Season four, again, established pods. Mermaids have existed long enough to have established pods. I believe Melan is a mermaid from a pod around China, around that area. Uh, and she is a mermaid who is essentially a fugitive and she is on the run. Fugitive, that's not the right word. She's basically on the run, not because of anything she did, because of whatever freaky fucking magic is happening in the world of mermaids. What I'm about to tell you, you're gonna go, hey, where, like, what the fuck was going on with this in the first three season of Mako Mermaids? Because why is it suddenly such a big problem in season four, but we didn't know anything about it beforehand? Good fucking question. <laughs> Again, the reality of the TV show in general, I don't know. Again, I don't know if, like, they didn't know if they were going to get a season four. So when they got a season four, they had to be like, fuck, what are we going to do? But uh, what happens in season four is Melan comes and joins up with our Mako mermaids and demands that they help her. Because what is happening is there is a water dragon that is completely wiping out mermaids and it has wiped out her entire pod. The water dragon, it's a kid's show. The water dragon does not kill mermaids, but as far as I'm concerned, it does. Because it's not actual death, it's obviously not carnage, but what the water dragon does is if you are a mermaid that gets attacked by the water dragon, it completely takes away your mermaid existence, your mermaid DNA, like it takes away all of your powers, everything. And in Mako Mermaids, where we know that mermaids have existed for some period of time to have established pods, to have established history, to have wars... Obviously, these mermaids have never once been human. Whatever we're considering, like, the non-made mermaids, the non-born like mermaids are. They have, they have never been. They were all born mermaids in these pods. The water dragon makes you human. So as far as I'm concerned, that's fucking murder. I don't think I'm wrong to say that. So the water dragon kills mermaids, essentially. And Melan is now with the Mako pod asking for help, asking like if we can defeat them, defeat the water dragon, if we can like change anything. And I think the mermaid council specifically comes and says like we can't do anything to reverse it. Like that's not the kind of magic we have, but we do have to defeat the water dragon. And that's most of what season four is, is finding out like what's going on with that. But we come to a couple points in the series or in the in the season where we find, uh, I believe it's a bracelet. I think that's what it is. It's specifically a bracelet. So again, jewelry being very prevalent in this whole universe, it's a bracelet specifically that has to be worn that can like harness something within the dragon. I don't know if it's the heart. I don't know if it's like the inner workings of like mermaids or what, but it's a bracelet that has the power to like it's basically a moon ring, but like even more amplified power. It's like the top of the power that you can get, basically. It has to be like, you know, with the power of the full moon, those kind of things. Uh, we find, you know, the bracelet, the artifact that can reverse whatever's happening with the moon, like with the water dragon. If anything's going to be able to fix it, it's going to be this. And Mimi gets attacked by the water dragon, but the water dragon doesn't do anything to her. Evie jumps in front of Zack to save him. Evie loses her mermaid powers. It's a lot of, like, close calls, like, scary things happening. You learn throughout season four that the water dragon is Nerissa. Something happened to her. I don't remember if she says specifically or, like, she got into trouble and then she, like, the next thing she knew she was waking up with her children. I don't remember if she says specifically. Again, if she does say specifically what happened to her, I will put it in here. Uh, but if not, then that's the question that we need to ask as well. Is what the fuck happened to Nerissa to turn her into, again, like, unconscious, hypnotic state monster that attacks her own people? Was it a merman thing? Did, like, a jilted lover when he found out that, like, one of her children was missing because she did have her children with a merman. 
It wasn't however else mermaids reproduce in the Mako universe. She does, Nerissa does have Zack and Mimi with a merman. And that's a big part of why she is afraid of Zack being hurt, being killed by her pod. He is a product of her connection with a powerful merman. That is established in the show, but they don't talk any more about it, which again is more questions, no answers that I want. What the fuck happened? How did she get turned into the water dragon? And also, when did she get turned into the water dragon? Because this was never a thought, this was never even a fear until season four. <laughs> like, it's wild to me. But we save Narissa, everything's fine. I believe Melan becomes part of the Mako pod because she doesn't have a home to go to. Evie is no longer a mermaid, which I, personal opinion, it's gonna jump out now. I think that's fucking bullshit, and I think Evie deserves her fucking tail. She has to give back her moon ring. I'm fucking livid about it. She should have been at least able to keep the moon ring if they couldn't let her keep her fucking tail. But where I want to get into the part of season four that's absolutely fucking wild to me is the bracelet that they get to be able to stop the water dragon and end up saving Nerissa is they find out that it's going to be on a display at a museum or like a like a, an aquarium but they're doing like a museum display it's found in a museum because there is a famous diver who was able to get deeper than like most divers like even with like the most expensive equipment and the most amount of funding people can't seem to get as deep as this diver can and this diver can get like far down into the ocean it's fucking crazy and like no one knows how they do it everything about make make o mermaids from season one up until like the last two or three episodes of season two it is established that it is not h2o it maybe exists in a similar universe, but it is not H2O. I said that at the beginning of this video. H2O is all happenstance. Even with mermaids from the 1950s, it was random happenstance, random magic. They don't have any more knowledge about being mermaids than Cleo, Ricky, and Emma do when they are mermaids. I told you the way season three of H2O ends is Cleo, Ricky, and Bella happy ending they saved the world from a catastrophe their moon pool which was like a very nice little set piece essentially was destroyed and left in the condition that it was where it looks like the moon pool in mako mermaids however they are not connected and that is what the two shows tell us the diver that was able to find the bracelet the artifact they need to rescue nerissa in Mako Mermaids. The reason this diver can go so far down further than any other diver seem to be able to do is because the diver is a mermaid and that mermaid is Ricky from H2O. I'm gonna say it again because I also can't believe this bullshit. The diver that ends up helping the mermaids of Mako Mermaids to an incredible degree, is a mermaid from the first series that we are essentially told does not connect to this series whatsoever. Because at the end of season four of Mako Mermaids, uh, they go back to the moon pool, the mermaids go back to the moon pool, and Ricky is there, and she's sitting there, and chilling. And if you're like, hey, that's kind of crazy, but maybe they're, like, using a universe where, like, Ricky is a mermaid, but she maybe, like, has no knowledge. No, because when they talk to her in the moon pool, she says something about, like, I really missed this place. I haven't been here in a while. And they ask, like, what happened to your friends? And similar to what Miss Chatham says in H2O is, like, you know, we all moved on and everything, which is just... Ah! I can't yell because my throat hurts, but like, bro! It is the same Ricky! It's not like an alternate universe, it's the same fucking Ricky from H2O, and she like blatantly says that. She's like, it looks different, I haven't been here in so long. There used to be, you know, it wasn't always just me, there used to be more of us, but you know, we moved on, whatever. So what the fuck were they doing? 
This is where I want you to get both of your notes from both parts of this video and let's have a fucking discussion because what the fuck do you mean? And this is where I said at the beginning of this video, the very beginning of this video, fucking an hour and a half ago, two hours ago, I did not connect the dots between the two shows to the point where somebody like me who is obsessed with the shows and cares a lot about them and looks much too deep into world building and everything. I didn't do this. They specifically did this with the inclusion of Ricky. They could have easily played it off. I feel like the inclusion of Ricky or any of the mermaids from H2O would have been just like a cool Easter egg in general, however you want to do it. It could have been like how they did with Miss Chatham, where like how Ricky finds uh, Julia's locket and it's like, well, Julia, you know, the owner of this locket is dead and this is like from her estate sale. They could have easily done the same thing where like all of these artifacts that Ricky had like, d like swam up like, you know, passed away, but like this was the this was the person who did it and like left a name somewhere on like a plaque. But no, no, they specifically included Ricky. And Ricky is not old in the show. She is not like Miss Chatham old. If we want to say that the Mako Mermaid, I don't know how old they're supposed to be. I think the wiki said that Zach is like 15. If we want to say they're in like their mid-teens, all of the mermaids and Mako Mermaids that are the main characters, Ricky is like 22 at best maybe 26 at the oldest like ricky is not an old woman she was supposed to be 15 16 in her time in h2o so it is not a far jump however in mako mermaids we are in this world where mermaids have existed for centuries at minimum there is history there is established like Let's say the Mermaid Council is a form of government. There is established government. There are established traditions. They have patrols. They have rules. They have laws. They have history of a war. I don't think me looking this deep into it is that crazy when they literally set it up to be questioned. <laughs> like, it does not connect. There is no sign of any kind of acknowledgement of mermaids whatsoever in H2O other than the mermaids we are given. The only history of mermaids we have in H2O are the girls from the 1950s. And even then, yes, the moon pool has existed sometime before that, but there are no other mermaids. There's no history that Julia, Louise, and Gracie have access to or even have knowledge of. There's nothing for them to find. What is found in H2O is the history that Miss Chatham passes down, but it's only the 50s to the 2000s. And it's not a lot of history. It's what happened with the mermaids, how the full moon affects them, how you can lose and or temporarily lose your powers, and the lockets. That is the only history we have. But then you bring Mako mermaids in with established history history with established lore and then put Ricky in here and act like it's just fine and dandy. It is the same moon pool. Ricky specifically says it is the same moon pool. So what the actual fuck? And there can be whatever anybody wants to say as like a cop out of like, well, it was hidden because they were trying to find out what's going on you know, with these new mermaids and blah, blah, blah. No, I refuse to believe it because the involvement of the Mermaid Council throughout the seasons of Mako Mermaids is fucking wild and sometimes ridiculously out of bounds. Like, I get they're the Mermaid Council and they're there to protect Mako Island, but some of the shit they do is just completely uncalled for and out of bounds. If there were random mermaids being made by the full moon and the magic they would have stepped in. The sea creature, primordial being, moon alien, there would have been stepping in from other mermaids. Imagine Ricky thinking that she has to solo interact with this fucking alien and surprise there's an entire pot of mermaids with moon rings to solve the problem. It would not just have been Cleo, Emma, and Ricky Cleo, Bella, and Ricky, oh my god, again, Bella, I'm so sorry, I do you dirty girl. It would not just be the three of them fighting to protect not only the moon pool, but the entire fucking world 
from this meteor, asteroid, whatever the fuck it was, if there was, in fact, Mako Mermaid Pods. Like, what are you doing? And it makes me, it's, it's because I am 28 years old and very much love these shows and am a whore for lore and world building. I am fucking obsessed. One of the reasons why I don't think I'm ever going to be able to write a book, and I doubt myself all the time about this, is because I am so focused on working on the world building that I'm not actually writing any fucking story. <laughs> I am so interested in everything about this. And there will never be answers to half of it. Because even on the wiki, where like people have like gone back and watched the shows and everything, I don't think a lot of these questions even have a chance of being answered. Because I don't know if everybody is asking the same questions. Where is Eric getting his information from? Why do the characters in Mako Mermaids have so much more information? Why do they have an established history? H2O has fucking nothing. It's three to four teenage girls just grasping at straws, desperately trying to get information so that they can exist. I need to like sit back. I'm leaning like into the camera. I'm like, listen to me, listen to me. Oh, I lowered the tripod. <laughs> But yeah, I have to like calm myself down now because this is like, I get so into this because it's important to me and I love this and I want like, I want fleshed out answers. I have, you can't see it, this like right back here, this blue thing, underneath this, I have those, the three uh, Legend of Zelda books, the Arts and Artifacts, the Encyclopedia, the Hyrule History, and the Making a Champion. I have all of those books because I am absolutely fucking obsessed with things like that. Like, let, don't even get me fucking started on the individual Legend of Zelda games, let alone Breath of the Wild. No, I have not played Tears of the Kingdom yet. But you know what I mean? The, I am into it. If I could have books like that for H2O and Mako Mermaids, I would literally foam at the mouth. I need to know. I need answers to all of my questions <laughs> because I have so many and I want to analyze it and I want to know the answers because that's exactly the kind of shit I'm into. So that is the end of the H2O uh, lore and world building analysis. <laughs> this is like an absolute passion project for me and I appreciate however long this video ends up being because I have two days worth of footage that are about an hour and then over an hour both. I don't know what it's going to be edited down to however long this video is. If you have come to watch it, thank you so much. Please give it a like if you enjoyed. I love this and I will be doing another video like this which is again looking at lore and world building in a different franchise in a different medium but this will be coming out another one will be coming out in October because it is magic themed and yeah this is something that like I am really excited to do and if you can't tell that I have special interest this is your <laughs> this is your little clue in anybody who stayed and watched this whole thing thank you so, so much for watching uh, don't forget, make sure you're checking out all of those infographics that have appeared throughout both parts of this video. However long it is, there will be double the infographics that there usually is. And do not forget that we are supporting Palestine. We are supporting Gaza. If you are on the side of not believing this is a genocide, if you think the protests that are happening, the student revolution that is happening across the United States in protest for Palestine and Gaza... If you are not on that side, if you don't agree with me, if you're rolling your eyes at me, just fucking unfollow me and block me, to be quite honest. You are not welcome here. You're not. You are incorrect if you do not think it's a genocide. And if you think that the protests that are happening across college campuses, and also we're not just, it's not just college campuses anymore. The day that I'm filming this, it has spread to just other protests in general, encampments, for Gaza and Palestine. It has spread. It is not just college campuses anymore. It is led by students, but it is not just them anymore. If you do not agree with them, if you think that like the protests are too much, just leave. I don't fucking want you here. I don't want you on my channel. I don't want you as a subscriber. I don't want you anywhere near me because you're fucking wrong. It's a genocide. It's an ethnic cleansing. The United States government is actively signing bills and whatever the fuck, like bills, acts, whatever, to give more money to Israel. 
they're using, if you live in the United States, they're using our tax dollars to continue to give them money to murder and destroy innocent people for land that they claim is theirs, but they want to make holy land on the graves of innocent people and children. If you have shit to say in my comments, just know you're getting blocked. I'm not going to do the whole like, well, like, hear me out. Mur, mur, mur. I'm not doing it. You're getting blocked immediately. Get fucked. This is a silly, fun, long form video about mermaids. But you will not forget about what's happening in Palestine. You don't get a fucking choice. Across my social medias, you don't get a fucking choice. They have to live it every single day for the last... 220 it's almost 230 230 days of this anybody that is still alive because most of, i be, i i don't have the exact percentage it'll be here at the bottom because i want to make sure that i'm fucking right when i say this but the majority of palestinian people are gone buried under rubble run over by tanks mass graves you're not gonna fucking forget that Thank you guys so much for watching. Once again, leave a like if the, on this video if you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye! It'll be shorter next <laughs> next week, I promise. I promise it'll be shorter. I can't do a long video like this. I'm losing my voice actively. <laughs> Bye, guys.